Okay, I want to pick up with. Um, Uh, sonnet 144 by Shakespeare. Last one by Shakespeare. <clears throat> Notice how the speaker begins. So, we have the speaker, A. Speaker, lover one, lover two. Two loves I have of comfort and despair, which, like two spirits, do suggest me still. And your gloss tells you suggest means tempt, and still means always. So, two loves I have of comfort and despair. Now, that can mean one love is a comfort, one love comforts me, and the other one makes me full of despair. Okay? Which, like to notice, spirits, that is, spiritual beings, you know, tempt me. They both are tempting, by the way. This isn't like in the old Warner Brothers Bugs Bunny cartoons where you have the good angel on one shoulder and the bad, you know, devil on the other shoulder. Though, look at the next line. The better angel is a man right fair. That's the golden-haired youth, Okay. The worser spirit is a woman colored ill. You got the gloss of a darker, ugly complexion or temperament. Okay. To win me soon to hell, that is to get me to hell as soon as possible. And your gloss for the equation of hell with sexual intercourse, see Sonnet 129, the heaven that leads men to this hell. That's the sonnet that begins, you know, lust. Expensive spirit and a waste of shame is less than action. Okay, so to win me soon to hell, my female evil tempteth my better angel from my side. So this one is the fair man. This one is the I'm trying to think of a better way to put it. Uh, we'll just call her the dark lady, okay? And notice what the speaker says. To tempt me to hell, what does the woman colored ill do? Tempt him, the fair man, from the speaker's side. Tempteth my better angel from my side and would corrupt my saint, my saint, to be a devil, wooing his purity, misery, with her foul pride. Okay? All kinds of biblical slash Christian imagery, obviously, throughout this poem. So, let's go back and unpack some of that a bit. So, to get me to end up in hell, my female evil tempteth my better angel from my side. Now, within the context of the poem, I'm talking about pulling this friend away from me. And I think the tempteth is talking about sexual intercourse. She sexually seduces him. Right? And notice this individual is referred to as my saint. Okay, what's the purpose of a saint? I mean, what is the purpose of sainthood? According to kind of traditional Christian theology, anybody who is a Christian is a saint. Okay? Another way of looking that, at that is a saint is a particularly exalted kind of Christian. Somebody who's really, really super spiritual kind of a thing. The speaker here is saying this individual is kind of like his patron. The person who is my guardian. The person who is my guide. The person I look up to. 
all right? But she is tempting him from my side. What does that do to the saint, the purity? It, <coughs> what, what, what's the word I want? Desanctifies, okay? Makes the friend impure. And would corrupt my saint to be a devil, right? Again, traditional Christian theology. What are the devils slash demons? Satan. Fallen angels. So once they were pure, now no more. Wooing his purity with her foul pride. Traditional Christian theology. What is the chief and foremost sin? Pride. Why? It's the sin of Lucifer. Lucifer, the light bearer, who said, I will ascend and be like the Most High. Ezekiel, Daniel, something like that. Okay? Line 9. And whether that, you've got a gloss, whether or not, whether that my angel be turned fiend, suspect I may. Why? Why suspect I may? Pause for a moment. Can I turn the volume down? And go back to not that one, not that one. So shall I love so shall I live, supposing thou art true, like a deceived. I look at you, your eyes say nothing but love, though I think, I believe, your heart is elsewhere. That's the speaker talking to, okay, possibly, possibly, that's the speaker talking to the better angel, looking in his face, okay, but thinking, you're no longer true to me. True how? Sonnet 116, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Okay? It's, and in Sonnet 116, the speaker is suggesting, even though I think you might have not mentally been unfaithful to me, but sexually, you know, you went over here, love is not love which alters when an alteration finds. I still love you. Up here, mentally. Spiritually, okay? So, back to 144. Whether that my angel be turned fiend, suspect I may. Whether you are now false to me, I think, yet not directly tell. He doesn't have, to quote Shakespeare, Iago, excuse me, Othello's ocular proof. In the play, Othello, Othello tells Iago, his right-hand man, who is trying to trick him, okay, because he wants to replace Othello as the chief officer and such. Iago makes Othello believe, leads Othello to believe that his wife, Desdemona, is cheating on him. And he says, unless I have the ocular proof, I won't believe it, unless I see it with my own eyes. And so... Iago contrives this plot to, to see Desdemona, okay, receive from another man a handkerchief. The handkerchief had been given to Desdemona by a fellow as a token of his love. Kind of like when um, Sir Bertolette's wife asks Sir Gowan for a token of his love. He goes, I don't have anything to give you. She says, well, let me give you something. She offers the ring, and then she gives him the sash, okay? So, Iago makes it so that this character, Cassius, has, finds this handkerchief. It's actually his wife who gives it. She gives it to him. He returns it to Desdemona at such a time that Iago creates that 
She had given the handkerchief to touch it. And now he's giving it back. When he gave it, he, a fellow, gave her the handkerchief. He told her how important this was. This was like the physical manifestation of his love for her. Never lose it. Never give it to anyone else. And he sees the other guy giving it back. For him, that's the ocular proof that they've done the deed, right? So, suspect I may, yet not directly know. I don't have proof. But being both from me, that is, you are both now separated from me, both to each friend. I'm up here alone. Meanwhile, they're now friends. How? Because the speaker introduced them. This is how they became friends. I guess one angel, this one, the fair man, in Others, hell. Okay, and there is a sexual pun there, by the way. Go back and look at Psalm 129. Well, the whole sonnet. Because <laughs> okay. what is hell? Literally, literally, hell. The word hell is related to the word, when I teach history in English language, I do this. It's related to the word cellar. It's related to the word hole. It's related to the word holster. All of these words, they go back 6,000 years to a Proto-Indo-European root word, a reconstructed word that essentially means Something to hide something else into. Okay? My friend in your hell. Yet. Notice in this sonnet, it's almost like the turn comes at the couple, not at line nine. Yet. This shall I ne'er know. I will never know this. Never know that what I've just suggested is true. But live in doubt. I'm always going to wonder. Till my bad angel, this one, fire my good one out. And you've got a gloss. To expel or reject my good angel. To fire out meant to drive someone or something away from a place by setting a fire. As, for example, in foxen, set a fire to the fields to get the foxes to flee. It can also mean fever. Notice, perhaps a glancing reference to venereal disease. Probably not so glancing. If you read widely in Renaissance literature, the university wits talk an awful lot about sexually transmitted diseases. And the symptoms, almost always the main one, being a high fever, burning, as well as burning desire and such. Right? So he says, I'm never going to know until she kicks you out, gets rid of you. And that's still open-ended, right? He still is not sure. Okay. Um, end of Shakespeare. Sonnets. Turn to, just a few pages on, Ben Jonson. Ben Jonson is a contemporary of Shakespeare's. 
You've got his birth date, 1572. Shakespeare's born 1564. So he's eight years uh, younger than Shakespeare, but lives 21 years after Shakespeare dies. The big difference between Ben Johnson and Shakespeare is Johnson is very well educated. All right? By the time Johnson is writing his plays and poetry, he does both, um, Johnson's kind of regarded as, as one of the most well-read, most well-trained writers around. In fact, Johnson in 1616, I'm trying to remember if we have a picture of this in your book. I don't think so. Johnson, in 1616, publishes a book. I'll put it on D2L. Well. He's not a lawyer. And the book has, you know, the cover like this, and it's this massive structure engraved on the cover of this book. And it has the words, The Works of Benjamin Johnson. which he publishes himself. So Shakespeare never published anything himself other than his, I think the four long poems are attributed to Shakespeare and they're published during his life by him, so to speak. Okay? The sonnets aren't published by Shakespeare and none of the plays are published by Shakespeare. Okay? So they, they could all be illegal copies. Johnson publishes this and he's the first kind of poet who says, what I do for a living is work. Like, real work. His father, I would say, really worked. He was a brick mason. You ever have an opportunity to do brick masonry? Do it for a couple weeks. I did it for about three months in between semesters in, in college. I took a semester off and screwed up my arm because I was slinging 100 pounds of mortar up scaffolding, you know, racks of bricks up scaffolding. Stuff. That's what Johnson's father did. And he did well enough, he was able to put his son through the best private school, so to speak, best elementary school in London. They had the best headmaster, a guy named William Mulcaster in front of London. And then he went to university, right, where he learned Latin and Greek. So he would have learned Latin and Greek like Shakespeare did through the elementary school. He learned more at university. So he knew Latin and Greek inside and out. I mean, and he knew the authors very, very well. Okay? Johnson writes poetry, he writes criticism, he writes plays, he writes what are these highly elaborate, what are called masks. Okay. So we're going to look at just a few of his poems, or three of them, I believe. No, four of them. Pages 903. For the first three poems, or page 903, on my first daughter to John Dunn and on my first son. John Dunn is another poet we're going to read, we're going to read after Johnson. Okay? So, on my first daughter. Let me back up for a minute. Go to the previous page, 902. It was common in this time period for a book to begin with a either a letter called an epistle or a poem to the reader. It's often, you know, the author to the reader. Look at um, Anne Bradstreet, the first American poet who's writing in the early 1640s, right? And she has a pretty long poem, the author to her book, not the author to the reader, where she talks about how the book came to be. It was book was illegally copied, taken by her brother-in-law to England, published, printed, brought back to the United States, and she's like, you know, you should have told me I would have fixed everything, all the flaws, etc. So, to the reader, pray thee take care that takes my book in hand, to read it well, that is, to understand. So, don't just read it and go, oh, that's pretty. He's saying, Figure it out. Understand it. Okay? Then there's a poem to the book. 
Now look at on my first talk. Uh, sorry, not Richard Mulcaster. William Camden, the first poem on page 903, that was the headmaster of the Westminster School um, that Johnson went to. Okay, So, on my first daughter, here lies to each her parents' Ruth, Mary, the daughter of their youth. Yet all heaven's gifts being heaven's due, it makes the father less too rude. At six months in, she parted hence with safety of her innocence, whose soul, heaven's queen, whose name she bears, in comfort of her mother's tears, hath placed amongst her virgin train, where, while that severed doth remain, this grave partakes the fleshly birth, which cover lightly the gentle birth. So what are we told? We've been told, understand, his daughter died when? She was six months old. I've known people who've lost children. It's the worst thing a parent can have happen. Here lies to each her parents Ruth. What does Ruth mean? We don't use that word by itself at all today. We only use it with this. Ruthless. It's an old English word, actually. What does ruthless mean? If someone is a ruthless killer, merciless, pitiless. So, here lies to each her parents mercy, pity, sorrow. Mary, the daughter of their youth. She was born, conceived when we were young. Yet, idea <laughs> that we saw all the way back in the wanderer, all heaven's gifts being heaven's due. What does the due there mean? It goes back to heaven. They are meant to be what? Returned. It makes the father less to rude, to cry, to pity, to be sorrowful. What you just told us? What's the speaker just told us? I know where my daughter is. She's in heaven. Okay. At six months in, she parted hence with safety of her innocence. How so? You know, in... Now, depending on which branch of Christianity one applies believes or thinks is being discussed here, you could say, um, no, she would be damned. She would go to hell. The medieval Catholic Church taught that unless you're baptized, you go to hell when you die, even babies, which is why it was important to baptize a baby very, very soon after birth. Typically, by the eighth day. Why? Because it was on the eighth day that Christ was circumcised, according to the Jewish tradition and custom. So if a child is born and dies three days after birth and has not been baptized, that child goes to hell. Hell is not simply, you know, lake of burning fire and all that kind of stuff. Dante's imagery of hell, while not canonically correct, canonically, according to the laws of the Catholic Church, it's metaphorically correct. That is, there are kind of different stations of hell. There's the place for really bad suffering and burning, and there's the place where you just kind of, <sighs> for all eternity, you sigh. Okay? That's where the babies are. Limbo. Neither here nor there. All right? So, Neither fully in heaven nor way down there in hell. Okay? So that's one idea. He's saying she died innocent. Like not stained by St. Augustine's notion of original sin. Why? Because an idea developed after the Middle Ages 
that you had what's called a for an age. An age of accountability. You're not accountable for your actions until that age. Right? How can a six-month-old sin? Do sin? No. Put two two-year-olds in a playpen with one toy. Then you can see, you know, sin alive and active. Mine, 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 now that kind of thing, right? So, six months in, she parted had safety of her in. She hadn't yet experienced stuff in this world. Whose soul, heaven's queen, whose name she bears. See, Protestants don't refer to Mary as heaven's queen. Johnson was Catholic. By the time he's writing this and publishing this, it is okay to write and publish stuff with Catholic leanings. It's okay to be Catholic in England. Elizabeth's dead. They're no longer executing people solely for being Catholic. Um, who soul heaven's queen, whose name she bears, in comfort of her mother's tears, that is, to ease... Ben Johnson's wife's tears have placed amongst her virgin train. There's this idea that in heaven, Mary has this train, like a like the wedding veil that trains behind a woman in a, in a marriage. She has these this long followers of all the virgins who died, either innocently or following Christ. Okay. Where while that severed doth remain. So the souls in heaven, what's that severed? The body. This grave partakes the fleshly birth. Which cover lightly, Jesus says. Why is he asking the earth to cover lightly her body? She's small and delicate. Why else? I mean, definitely right. While that severed doth remain. What's the while implied? They won't always be severed. Resurrection, body will be reunited with the soul. Right? Now look at the one to John Dunn. Dunn is a contemporary of Shakespeare and Johnson. Dunn was born in the same year, 1570. 1570, yeah, 1572. He dies a few years before Johnson. Dunn doesn't write plays. Dunn writes poetry. And later on, once he becomes a priest, he writes sermons. Okay. Dunn, the delight of Phoebus and each muse, who to thy one all other brains rebuke. Whose every work of thy most early wit came forth an example and remains so yet. Longer unknowing than most wits do live, in which no affection praise enough can give. To it thy language letters art's best life, which might with half mankind be tame a strife. All which I meant to praise, and yet I would but leave, because I cannot as I should. Okay? Now, this was published in 1660. I don't know if we know when exactly it's written. It could have been written before then. could have been written when he published the works. The reason that's important is because Dunn, in the 1590s, through, well, at least... 1615, 1614, Dunn is a quote-unquote secular author, or what's often called a profane author. He writes about profane things, not profane as in profanity, but non-holy, let's say. Most of his early poetry, much of his early poetry, is about romantic 
sexual erotic love. Okay? So let's go back and look at that again. Done the delight of Phoebus and each muse. Phoebus, Apollo, god of poetry. So he's saying, Done, you are the delight of Apollo, the god of poetry, and each muse. What does it mean by that? Who to thy one all other brains refuse. To your brain, Apollo and the other eight muses focus all their attention. He's saying, and they ignore the rest of us. Get your gloves. Johnson's syntax here is compact. Apollo and the muses refuse to bestow on other brains the gifts, the gifts they've given done, or they reject all other all brains in favor of his. What is the speaker saying? Two words. Not fair. Why did they give you all this inspiration? It's like when I teach my Tolkien rolling class. I always tell my students, how do you, you know, you know how J.K. Rowling came up with the idea of Harry Potter? And then most of them tell me. And, you know, she's on this train from Manchester to London, and then one day, you know, one time, she's on it, and she's a nobody. She is an unwed mother living on Scottish welfare with few dollars to her name. In one moment, she has no idea about Harry Potter, and literally a minute later, she has an idea of a lot of boy who discovers on his 11th birthday that the greatest dark wizard in the world killed his parents and tried to kill him. What happens because of that idea that comes to her in 1991? 16 years later, she's the wealthiest woman in Great Britain. Wealthier than the queen. Seven years later, she's an internationally famous author. I mean, she goes from nothing to today, she gives away tens of millions of dollars a year to various charities. I mean, why her? Why not me? I've been on that journey. Well, not from Manchester, but Leeds and Liverpool and all kinds of other people. Why not any, you know? How does creative inspiration work? Just sit there and think about that for a while. Where do those ideas come from? Okay. So, whose every work of thy most early wit, and I think Johnson's talking there probably about the 1590s, came forth example. That is, Dunn wrote it, and it was immediately the model to be followed. Dunn wrote in the 1590s, for example. He wrote a bunch of what are just called songs and sonnets. Songs and little love poems. That's what sonnet means, little love poems. Okay? He also wrote satires, modeled kind of after juvenile and such. Okay? He wrote other prose. He wrote other poetry. He wrote a series called Paradoxes and Problems that were all kind of poking fun at women, for the most part. Right? A lot of Women academics really don't like that. One of my first questions, I had a job interview. One of the first questions out of somebody about this is at the Modern Language Association in Chicago, I think, was, you know, why are you studying Dunn when he's such a chauvinist? Boom. You know, how are you going to answer that? I think all the interviewers were women. And I just said, well, I'm not going to get a job here. So I just went full barrel and said, he's not a chauvinist. And kind of argued why. We'll talk about that when we get there. So, longer a knowing than most Luke Wits do live. Longer a knowing. He's saying, you've been intellectually aware, knowledgeable, learning longer than most Wits live. Now, he doesn't mean that literally. He just kind of means, maybe you've heard this phrase before. Doug kind of has... He's saying, your mind is like an old soul. You understand much, much more than most 
wits. Think about Dunn, as opposed to, for example, Johnson, and many of the other university wits you know, that I've referred to. As far as we know, Dunn never took a university degree. And there's a reason for that, you think. Talk about it when we get to it. Right? So, longer knowing than most wits do live, in which no affection praise enough can give. That is, and as much as I like you, I, I can't give you enough praise. Kind of like what Shakespeare said back in that one sonnet um, that I alluded to, but we did not read. Sonnet 106, when in the chronicle of wasted time, I see descriptions of the fairest whites, where the speaker finally comes down and, to say, today... We've got the greatest beauty in the world, but we don't have the tongues to describe it. We don't have the words to describe it. Johnson is here saying, I, I, I can't give you praise enough. To it, what's the it? Thy language, letters, arts, best life. Language, letters, arts. Those are all things one learns. Best life? It's life. It's not what one learns, it's how you live. Which might with half mankind maintain a strife. And I, I could be totally wrong. Totally wrong. I think he's saying with men. With men, not women. Why? The strife is kind of for women. Right? Men look at you, Dunn, and they go, can I write with that? How can I compare with that? All which, that is, all previous eight lines, everything I've just said, I meant to praise. Okay, if I meant to praise it, then the speaker is saying, I obviously, obviously didn't. Why? And yet I would, that is, I still wish to, I want to, believe, because I can't. I'm just kind of tongue-tied, so I'll just shut up now. Me and. All right? On my first son. So, on my first daughter. Now on my first son. Farewell. Thou child of my right hand. You've got a gloss. That means the name Benjamin. Why child of my right hand? Why not the child of the left hand? Anybody know what left is in Latin? I think I just learned this word. Sinister. The word sinister means left. Okay. Go throughout the Old Testament. And when, when you talk about God's power, God's judgment, God's righteousness. How is it always performed? The right hand. You know, when St. Stephen is being stoned and he sees heaven opened up, what does he see? He sees Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. Right? Everything happens on the right side. It's the hand of authority, power, all that kind of stuff. Farewell, thou child of my right hand. The speaker is saying, you were my best. <laughs> you were my everything. And joy. My sin was too much hope of you loved boy. How can a parent have too much hope of their child? Just let that question hang. Seven years thou wert lent to me, for the child dies at age seven, and I thee paid. Notice the language. You were loaned, and I paid you back. Like there was a promissory note when the child was born. You're going to get him for seven years. Make use of these seven. Exacted by thy fate on the just day. Just the appointed, the appropriate, 
the right, neat, fitting, and proper day. Again, like a promissory note. You take out a loan, and what happens? You are told when that loan essentially is due. Okay? Unless you refinance. Can't refinance this one. Oh, could I lose all father now? It's not a question. It's an assertion. It's an emphatic statement. It's like the speaker is saying, it would be better never to have had a son. For why will man lament the state he should be? What's the state he's lamenting that he should envy? Fatherhood. That's, I think, the first possible reading. The other possible reading is Where's the son? Death. Is the father saying, I shouldn't lament death when I envy it? Because you want to die? Is this some kind of suicidal wish? Here's the state, or here's another reading for that son. I think the first one is father. He laments the state of fatherhood. It would be better never to have had a son. Why? Because of the huge gaping hole he has in him. When he should envy being a father. Here's another possible reading for state. <clears throat> to have so soon escaped worlds and flesh's rage. And if no other Remember Hrothgar's homily? He gets down towards the end of it and he tells Beowulf, you know, Beowulf, you're going to die. Either illness or old age or flood or war or fire or the spear or illness or old age or the spear or the sword, you're going to die. Period. Right? But here, and there's no hope. No hope expressed there. You're going to die. You're going to go to Jesus be with the saints the whole night. No. Here, notice what the hope is. To have so soon escaped the world's and flesh's rage. What, what's the world's rage? Turn on CNN. Turn on the news. Crap everywhere. That's what he is. Hamlet slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Flesh's rage? Now, that's what goes on in your own body. You know? It's this, it's the knees falling apart, it's just finding out yesterday, oh, you're a good candidate for hearing aids. Why? Because every time anybody speaks up to class, I go, what? Speak up. You know? I always feel like I'm in a tunnel. Well, apparently that's one of the main symptoms for you know, needing hearing aids. So, flesh is rage, and if no other misery, that is, if the misery of being alive in this world or the body falling apart is not enough, how about age? Just getting old. Now, flesh is rage, let me back up for a minute, is probably talking about the physical passions, not being able to control oneself. And age is talking about the falling apart, the decrepitness. Rest in soft peace. Peace, right? No problems, no suffering. And ask, if somebody asks you, say, here doth lie, I love this line, it's just beautiful. Ben Johnson, his best piece of poetry. Poetry. Is this inscribed on the headstone? I have no idea. Did he write it to be inscribed on a headstone? It'd be a great poem to put on a headstone. If somebody asks why you're here, say, here's Ben Johnson's best piece of poetry. Meaning two things, the poem and what else? The sun. 
Because poetry comes back from that Greek word poesis, which simply means what? Here, here is my best thing. Here's the best thing I ever made. For whose sake, henceforth, that is, for your sake. Is it that? <laughs> or is it for Ben Johnson's sake? For whose sake, henceforth, all his vows be. I think the his there is talking about Ben Johnson. The first, whose sake, is referring to the dead son. For whose sake, henceforth, all his, my, vows be such as what he loves, he, Ben Johnson, may never love too much. If you love it, it isn't love the natural extension of liking, you know, you're in your teens and you like somebody and you get really serious and you, you finally say you like love or whatever. It, it's progression, right? What's he mean? Why does he draw this distinction, this contradiction between liking and loving? As what he loves may never like too much. What do parents sometimes do to their children or what do parents sometimes think about their children what do they want to have happen in their children let me put it this way we're going to leave Paul out for a moment ladies assume you're going to get married if you're not already married I have no idea okay Assume you're going to get married. Popular culture vision. Popular culture um, portrayal. What might, if they're still alive, your mothers do? Let's say, for that wedding ceremony. Any ideas? Louder? Did they cry? Cry? Okay, what else? Um, make sure everything is perfect. Keep going, that's, you're on the right track. The, the popular, I mean, you see it in sitcoms, for example. What do the mothers try to do? They take control of the wedding. Why? You're going to have the wedding. I do. You're going to have the wedding. I always want to. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be, you know, Paul the wedding planner. Everything's going to be wonderful. Okay? I think that's kind of the idea he's getting at. What's he mean? If you like something too much, what do you do? You put all your eggs in that basket. And he's kind of saying, yes, I'm going to love it, but I'm not going to like it so much. That, what's implied here? The speaker is destroyed. Everything, thou child of my love. No. What do parents want for their children? They want the best for their lives. They want their children to have, most of us do, I've got four kids, all grown up. They want their children to have better lives than they do. They want them to have better homes, better incomes, to be better people, you know. That's, I think, kind of what he's getting at. Okay? Now, we've only got a couple minutes left. Or today, five minutes left. So let's start his epitaph on Shakespeare, page 907. Now, this is first published, it's only published, in the first folio. In the first folio, which I passed around the other day, You've got a bunch of dedicatory poems, right? These are published in 1623 when the first folio was published. Oddly enough, and this is one of the bits of evidence 
adduced by the anti Stratfordians. The people who say William Shakespeare's Stratford on Avon was not William Shakespeare, the author of the poems and plays. One of the pieces of evidence they adduced is when Shakespeare died, nobody, nobody wrote a commendatory poem on his death. It took seven years. Why? Much, much, much more minor poets, I mean, nobody's, had books written about them. My major professor did an entry for a dictionary of national biography or a dictionary of literary biography on a guy named oh, which one was it? William Carey, Edmund Carey, can't remember which. Who's a minor poet? Really minor poet, died in 1630. And he had a little slim volume of commendatory praising of obsequies kind of poetry written about him when he died. Why didn't Shakespeare? I mean, Johnson's going to call him the soul of the age. So the anti Stratfordian say, nobody wrote anything about him. Why? Because the William Shakespeare of Stratford died. Okay. Lack of evidence is not proof of something, though. So, to the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, and what he has left us. To draw no envy, Shakespeare, on thy name, am I thus ample to thy book and fame. Notice, thy book, what's the book? First folio, and fame, while I confess thy writings to be such as neither man nor muse can praise too much. It's impossible for a human being, to, human being to praise you too much. What else? It's impossible for one of the muses, one of the inspirers of poetry to praise you too much. He's just elevated Shakespeare above the muses, essentially. Okay? Tis true in all men's suffrage. Everybody agrees with what I just said. That's what suffrage means. Everybody would have liked that. They would vote that to be true. But these, these ways were not the paths I meant to thy praise. That is, scratch that. That's not what I meant to, to start with. For silliest ignorance on these may lie. Silliest means foolish. Ignorance. Not knowing. On these, the things I've just referred to, may light, they may fall upon these, which, when it sounds at best, echoes right. That is, it's merely kind of restating what others have said. Hmm, okay. Or blind affection, which doth ne'er advance the truth, but gropes and urges all by chance. Blind affection. You're out somewhere, you're talking to somebody, you mention Shakespeare. Oh, I love Shakespeare. And then you start talking to them, even though they don't know Jack Squat about Shakespeare. That's blind affection. Or crafty malice might pretend this praise and think to ruin where it seemed to raise. That is, someone might pretend to praise you, but what they really intend is to draw you down. Why? Because of malice. It's hatred. These are as some infamous bod or whore, a bod, a man or woman, a woman who sells other women for sex, right? should praise a matron. What could hurt her more? The her, the matron. Who's the matron? The older socialite lady who's got a great reputation, etc., etc. Channel 5. We'll stop here. So we will pick up with line 15. A little mark here. On Friday. I'm going to put a quiz up. It'll be due Sunday. I'm going to put a quiz up just of Shakespeare's sonnets. Okay? Here's what you need to know. Be able to put the first couple lines of the sonnets we did with the sonnet number. So I have like, you know, and open two lines. Identify that sonnet just with the number. Okay? 
and it'll just be the ones that we actually discussed. 